Hey, hey everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to our, our panel. Um, and we will uh, start here. Uh, so I'm going to be, my name is Kurt Opsahl. Uh, I am the Associate General Counsel for Cybersecurity and Civil Liberties Policy with the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, and uh, I uh, am a special counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation as a volunteer. And I am the moderator for today's panel. So I think we'll start by just going down the line here and everyone can do uh, a brief inter introduction and then we'll, we'll get going from there. Hi there, I'm Corinne McSherry and I'm the legal director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit um, that focuses on digital rights advocacy. We um, accomplish that through litigation, through lobbying in Congress. Um, through advocacy um, internationally and um, in the United States. And then we also build tools um, that help you protect your privacy and security and teach people how to use them. Okay, that's us. Uh, I'm Meredith Rose. I'm the Senior Policy Counsel at a group called Public Knowledge. We are a DC-based consumer advocacy organization that works on a wide range of tech issues. So everything from net neutrality to privacy to competition and antitrust policy to uh, copyright and intellectual property. Uh, and a lot of the work that we do deals with Section 230. So that is why I am here. And I'm Dwayne Gatesell. I'm an intellectual property lawyer in Austin, Texas, and do a lot of copyright, trademark, personality rights, that sort of thing. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get this thing started. I'm going to give a well first just a, a short introduction of uh, the the topic here, and uh, and specifically we're talking about two uh, two bills that have uh, proposed in Congress: the Earn It Act and the Stop CSAM Act. Uh, I. They're both acronyms. Congress really likes to have acronyms. I don't remember what uh, what they all uh, spell out, but uh, uh, stop CSAM. It's worth noting that the CSAM there is child sexual abuse material, so it's trying to uh, and and that uh, that thing in particular and earn it. Uh, you know what that's yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, Congress really likes to make these back backronyms. But what they're, why people are concerned about these uh, these bills, are in part because the dangers they pose to uh, encryption, that they propose to require, uh, you know, or put <coughs> burdens upon uh, social media companies that would be likely solved best or most easily by those companies by scanning the material that people. Uh, are sending in what would otherwise potentially be end and encrypted communications. Uh, and so it has raised a lot of concerns. While these are not their uh, <laughs> purported purposes, uh, mostly their purported purposes are about uh, protecting, the, protecting the children, uh, but they have a side effect that has raised a lot of alarms. They do have some uh, uh, provisions in there that were designed to address these concerns, but those provisions are weak and uh, may leave the door open to client-side scanning, which we can get into a little bit more detail in a bit. Uh, and they also propose to undermine Section 230 protection. <coughs> Section uh, 230 is a provision of the Communications Decency Act of uh, 96 that uh, uh, you may have heard of, even following in, in the news, but it is the provision that provides liability protection uh, for online, uh, online entities, uh, basically saying that the soapbox is not liable for what the speaker has said uh, and for social media companies and uh, amongst many others. It is a very important part of their ability to be able to put things online, user-generated content, <laughs> Uh, that might otherwise have led to their liability, and if it does lead to their to, to liability, then they have to be much more cautious on what they allow on the platforms. So let's give some some of the context of these these bills because some of these are, are in context have been going on for several years. One of them is the background on the crypto wars, the wars about uh, providing strong uh, encryption for communications. And uh, yeah, Corinne. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, if I can oh, stop coughing, I'm uh, very happy to tell you all about it. <coughs> okay, let's see if I can do this. If not, well, I'll kick it to someone else for a minute. <coughs> so the crypto wars. 
That is the term. Okay, I should take a minute. So I will. I will jump in because I actually looked up the acronyms. Um, Stop CSAM actually uh, is an acronym for strengthening transparency and obligations to protect children from suffering abuse and mistreatment. So CSAM actually doesn't stand for CSAM uh, in this because of course it doesn't. Uh, and earn it is short for eliminating abusive and rampant neglect of interactive technologies act of 2020. Now I guess 2020. To 2023, yeah, whichever we're on. They've, they've, they've introduced time. it at least three times in the, the last four years. The third time is just as cursed as the first two. All right. I think I'm better now. All right. So I think we should explain a little bit why we're worried about these in terms of encryption. I'll get there. Just give me a minute. I'll talk through it. So what happens for these bills is, particularly earn it, is they create these sort of commissions that will set up out best practices that platforms have to comply with if they want to keep 230 protections. And it is pretty clear, despite some language, that those best practices are going to include no end-to-end encryption. Um, end-to-end encryption will be a sign, could be used as evidence that you are facilitating child pornography. Um, and, <clears throat> and also, you would lose the uh, Section 230 safe harbors in a different bill, um, which everybody relies on. Um, if you deploy cr- encryption. And the reason we expect this is because the best practices commissions are going to be dominated by law enforcement and national security people probably too. And those are people who have wanted for a very long time to put limits on the availability of encryption. And this has its origins in actually some of the earliest days of EFF. And um, Bruce Schneier calls it, it's sort of the security versus security problem it's, uh, and it's been going on for decades so on the one hand people want secure communications lots of us want secure communications for all kinds of perfectly legit reasons on the other hand many of us also want a different kind of security which is that crimes get solved and law enforcement especially wants that kind of security um, these come into conflict because really good encryption can locks out bad guys locks out good guys, locks out everybody. That's the idea, especially end-to-end encryption. Um, so, um, so law enforcement has for many years been complaining about this and saying, you know, in the internet age, if we can't get access, if we can't scan communications, or at least have like a one, a little golden key, a back door into the encryption so that we can only to get bad guys, we promise, um, uh, if, we can't, if we can't sort of break our way into encryption for good purposes, then bad guys get away with crime. Um, so this has been a tension for a very long time, and EFF has been involved in it for a very long time. And just a couple sort of high points in it are, um, one of our earliest cases was called Bernstein versus DOJ. That was a case where a student, um, uh, it, sorry, in the early 2000s, so a student uh, developed an encryption algorithm. And the U.S. government said, that's great. Um, We need to review that before you publish it, before you share it to anybody. We need you to register as an arms dealer because this could be used in this way. And essentially, that creates a problem under the First Amendment because it's what's called a speech licensing agreement. If you have to go to the government in order to get permission in order to speak, uh, then there's a problem. That was an interesting and important presidential case, which EFF won because it established the principle that code is speech protected by the First Amendment. Um, yeah, that was really good. Bernstein versus DOJ. You can look it up. It's all over EFF's website. OK, so we won that one. Yay, win for that. Uh, then a few years later, under the Clinton administration, actually, this actually predated it. Sorry. Under the Clinton administration, we had something called the Clipper Chip. And this was a similar kind of thing. The idea was that uh, they were going to require commercial companies developing encryption, commercial encryption technologies provide a back door for government officials so that they could break the encryption if they needed to go after bad guys. Um, And then fast forward a lot um, to the 2010s when um, we have um, the, in the wake of uh, the San Bernardino massacre, which some of you may remember, um, the FBI said in order to go after the bad guys and figure out whether the killer had any other associates in order to find them, we need to break into his iPhone. But his iPhone was encrypted. So they got an order, uh, they got a court order requiring Apple to basically 
design a way in because Apple actually has specifically designed it so it can't get in. That is how they build their software. The FBI said, well, you need to fix that because we need to read this phone and we need to do it now. Apple fought back to its credit and said, you know, if you do that, you're going to put at risk you know, millions of iPhone users because the one thing that every technologist worth their salt will tell you is there isn't a back door that is only open to good guys. It just does not work that way. And uh, Apple fought back, and the night before the hearing on the issue, uh, the FBI said, oh, actually, we found a way, a, a different, uh, you know, a different hack. We're good. Never revealed what that was. We weren't able to find out, but basically, it turns out they didn't need that warrant. They didn't need Apple to, like, rewrite their software for the FBI at all. They had another path. Um, so these are just sort of over and over, but every time, every time, the, the law enforcement doesn't give up in the United States or in the UK. Their view is, in order for us to get the bad guys, you have to give us this. And it can be very persuasive when you go to a, your congressperson and say, look at all this horrible stuff that's happening. We need to be able to go after it. Encryption is getting in the way. We're really sorry, and we think Silicon Valley should just tech its way out of this. Nerd harder, people. And it can be very difficult to explain why that's not an option. All right, thank you. Um, and then also a piece of context, uh, the, there were some bills called uh, SESTA-FOSTA. Meredith, want to go Yeah. The detail there? Um, so just quick show of hands, who is familiar with SESTA-FOSTA? Or who has heard the acronym? OK, more hands. Um, all right, so the very short version, uh, Section 230, as Kurt explained, is basically the law that says the soapbox is not liable for the speech of the speaker standing on it. Um, and it means, in this case, that platforms are not liable for potentially, potentially, you know, with, with very specific exceptions, um, generally the speech that occurs on their platform. Um, now, SESTA and FOSTA were a pair of laws that I believe came down in 2018-ish. Pre-pandemic, time is wobbly. Um, so SESTA-FOSTA was this pair of laws which were designed to attack sex trafficking. And I'm, I'm going to put that in quotes. So they were sold as bills to fight sex trafficking. Now, what they actually ended up being, this is to abridge the narrative substantially, um, but what they actually ended up being was remove, bills that removed the protections of Section 230 um, for you know instances in which a platform, I believe, either facilitated sex trafficking, again facilitated very vague language, um, or prostitution, uh, which basically read as sex work of any kind. Uh, and so what the platforms did was they overcorrected in in policing the kind of content that's on their platforms, which is why if you follow sex work com communities, um, you know, pretty much anywhere online there's just exodus after exodus. And so, you know, I think one of the first visible uh, results was that Craigslist shut down its personal section. Um, now, this was intended originally to go after Backpage. There is an entire episode. I will not get into the whole Backpage saga. Um, there's a podcast called Ripcorp, which documents, each episode documents the downfall of a specific corporation. They did an entire episode on Backpage, which is phenomenal. Highly recommend you go listen to it. Um, but anyway, the very short version of all of this is that we had this law which was ostensibly going after sex trafficking and ended up ballooning into this sort of anti-sex work crusade. And you had overcorrection. Um, you had sex workers kicked out of platforms. You had tools that sex workers used to vet their clients and to share information about clients for their own safety. Those got shut down um, basically out of a fear of liability. And so we have seen these sorts of, um, you know, protect victims of sex trafficking hand in hand with protect the children that end up being used, you know, with these like very noble and sympathetic sort of talking points that they're sold under have ended up becoming vehicles for this broader um, push and this sort of broader um, impact radius on who they affect. All right, and so uh, and to just drill down a little bit, uh, so you know, Section Two Thirty passed uh, a long time ago, and then at that time, uh, you know, Congress not only passed it but included in it uh, several provisions saying about the you know the importance of having that to develop the uh, then you know new new economy uh, that it, uh, it turned out to be a thing that was very successful in in, in doing it. So uh, so why is it why is it so controversial? Why why did you know Congress uh, going after it now. Uh, Congress has been really mad about 230 for quite a while. Um, 
Partly because there's always, I mean, this is a little more flippant than I really probably should be, but there's always going to be somebody saying something you don't like on the internet. Um, lots of things that are potentially defamatory get said on the internet. Um, and also, you know, the internet is used by harassers to brigade and harass and drive, especially mostly marginalized populations off of various platforms and, and do all kinds of damage. I have personally been on the target radius of Kiwi Farms, so I can speak to that. Um, there is a very difficult balancing act that has to be done on a policy level between First Amendment rights, which includes speech that uh, some lawyer shorthand is awful but lawful. It is speech that is bad. It is speech that is morally vacant in most cases or actively <coughs> harmful. But it is still, for better or for worse, protected by the First Amendment. This includes most hate speech, as sort of colloquially understood. Um, and that that is the kind of speech that has First Amendment protection at the end of the day. Um, and so there is a balancing act to, to, there's a needle that folks have been trying to thread, some with better results than others, some with better intentions than others. Um, to essentially say, well, you know, this isn't, the speech isn't illegal. How much leeway do we want platforms to be able to have to craft their own content moderation guidelines is another big part of this. Um, there's, there's two parts of Section 230, just to back up a little bit. Um, the part that most people think about when they think of Section 230, and the, the thing that you hear people complain about a lot is um, this, this, you know, the platform is not liable for what gets published on it. Again, with some very specific exceptions. Copyright, notably, not covered by Section 230. Copyright is special. Um, I say this snarkily as a copyright lawyer. I was going to say, yes, it is. It is. very. <laughs> it's very special as we are constantly being reminded. Right. Um, but that's one part of 230. The other part of 230 is that platforms are not liable for their content moderation decisions to remove stuff. Um, it gives them the legal leeway to craft their own content moderation policies and to say, like, you know what? We just, we're not, no Nazis on this platform. That is protected, that decision is protected under Section 230. Um, and that, those kinds of decision-making exercises um, invariably are going to piss some people off. Um, and so it, we've had this like kind of bizarro situation in Congress um, really since 2015, give or take, um, but like really pronouncedly since the 2016 election, where you have everybody being mad about 230, and both sides are yelling, like, we need to, ref we need to fix 230. And generally from the left, the, the reason we need to fix 230 is because there's so much hate speech and people are getting brigaded and like swatted and driven out of their homes and it's all being enabled on these platforms. Um, and then from the right, it's because they're banning too many people from Twitter. Um, and too many people specifically that I agree with from Twitter. So it's either we're not cracking down enough or we're cracking down too much. Um, and the wrong people are doing the cracking and the wrong people are making the decisions about it. But these, you know, on a superficial level, it comes across as, well, 230 is broken and we need to fix it. But if you actually drill down on the reasons, they're diametrically opposed. Um, but at the end, that's created a huge amplification for this idea of, like, we need to reform Section 230. All right. Well, I think a very useful context, and we'll just add one other aspect of this, is that... Um, the companies really, really like having 230. It saves them a lot of time, trouble, and labels them to do things. And so by by using these bills to make it sort of conditional so they would have to earn it to get their protections from 230, this uh, gives a lot of leverage to, uh, to Congress to be able to try to convince them to do the things that, that Congress wants to, them to do that might be unconstitutional if Congress just legislated it, or and also there might be disagreement exactly as to what that uh, what that is. Uh, so, uh, and in, in this case, they they seem to be at least endangering uh, end and encryption uh, while while doing so. Uh, so, maybe, you know, uh, some softballs for the, for the panel, but. Why is that important? Why do we care about, especially when they're just trying to go after, you know, uh, child sexual abuse materials? Why is it important to have and and uh, encryption? Let me ask a question of if I can. Sorry. Are you going to ask if everyone knows what that is? Uh, I was going to say. We'll go ahead and do that. But uh, end to end encryption, as you probably know, is where, like on a messaging service like WhatsApp, for example, that only the sender and the recipient can read that message. The service, the server itself 
does not have access to that information, cannot read it, isn't able to read that message. So it's secure from the person who's sending it to the person who's receiving it. And what I was going to ask is, who here has ever received notice that your personal data has been hacked or has been exposed? Let me see hands. Just about everybody. That's why this is important. That's why encryption is necessary. That's why it's not an easy thing to say, oh, sure, of course, we're just we're doing this for the kids. Great. I'm cynical about politicians and their motivations. I don't believe they're doing it for the kids. That's me personally. I think they're doing it because they want power and control and because law enforcement insists on knowing and so forth. And OK, fine, I get it. But to me, it, it's the old aphorism of you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If 98%, 99% of the usage is good and is important and is protected, why would you destroy that when 99% of the people, and I don't know what the percentage is, but when most people are using it properly and only a very small minority are using it improperly? It's a mistake. And granted, government is not known for its surgical precision. It tends to go nuclear on problems. But that lays waste to everyone. So to me, that's kind of the wrong way to go about doing something. OK, great. Who's not for stopping child sexual abuse material? That's an easy sell. But how you go about doing it when it destroys rights for everybody else in the entire society who's using it lawfully and for intended purposes, that to me, there's something wrong with that approach. I will also point out just as a rhetorical policy matter. A lot of policy gets, you know, I mean, we joke about this at like basically every panel about bills. You know, the first step in pitching a bill is why don't you think of the children? Um, that is always the vehicle that is like your go-to. You don't want to be seen as the person speaking out against, you know, like you don't want to get tarred as like, well, you're defending CSAM. Like, no, I just think this is a bad bill. Um, as, as, a, as a queer woman who has a lot of family who are varying stripes of queer, my sister-in-law is not legally allowed to use a bathroom in the state of Florida. Um, the very existence of some people, as if you have followed both, if, unless you've really been living under a rock uh, the last few years, the very existence of some people is considered pornographic under the law in some states, and it is getting worse. Um, and one thing, if you follow really civil liberties intersection with law enforcement at all, uh, a thing you realize very quickly is that you cannot give law enforcement a toy and say, only use it for this. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, I have a toddler. <laughs> if I hand the toddler a toy hammer, his sandwich is getting hammered. Uh, the walls are getting hammered. His sister is getting hammered. Everything is going to get hammered. Um, similarly with cops, uh, the analogy got away from me there. Having said that, um, I have a very hard time, and I think I would be hard pressed to find anybody who follows this who would readily believe, oh yeah, this is only going to be used for documented cases of childhood sexual assault material, um, that this is not going to summarily be turned into a weapon against the most potentially marginalized folks currently living in our country. The government has never overreached, has it? Absolutely Ever? never. Never. Um, you know, just casual throwback Thursday, you know, if we all remember that Greg Abbott sent a request to the what is it, the state of Texas's uh, Department of Motor Vehicles asking for the names and addresses of every person who had changed their gender marker on their uh, driver's license in the last 10 years, just because. Um, so yeah, call me paranoid. Yeah, so there's, there, there's one additional uh, piece of this, which is that um, even if we just confine it to CSAM, um, even if that were possible to do, so there are huge databases now that are compiled um, by a group called NICMIC, which is like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, and when those big databases are actually vetted, like there was a 2020 study that vetted, uh, that vetted one of those databases. Um, this was from the, U, from the Irish uh, Police Department. And they found that um, roughly, let's see, 20, yeah, 20% 20 of that entire database was actually you know, verifiable CSAM. So there's a whole lot in there that is not accurate, right? But, it's, but that doesn't mean it's not gonna be action, there isn't gonna be action taken against them. And then there was also, this is just last year, there was a New York Times story about two dads, separate people, but two separate times that Google's database, uh, Google's database um, had, Google had scanned their photos and flagged them 
for CSAM because they had photos of their kids. One of them was a photo that the guy took of, for his, of his kid to send to the pediatrician because, you know, this is right in COVID. And he, the pediatrician said, well, just take a picture of, of this rash that you're worried about and send it to me. So he did. That's what the doctor told him to do. And it was flagged by Google for CSAM. Google notified the cops. Um, both, for both of them, their accounts were shut down. Ultimately, the, the cops cleared them. Like, you know, once they came and they talked to them, and they were like, no, 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 this is totally wrong, but it doesn't matter. Google never figured it out. Their accounts were down until the New York Times talked about it. But either way, like, imagine if you were that father. This is like such a nightmare for a parent to have cops coming to your door. And if you're not, you don't look like the right kind of person, you know, you got CPS in a second and you've got to fight your way out. So this is, it's, it's not even so simple if we just, again, CSAM is terrible. That's not the point. The point is, we, there's a lot that we can't trust about this whole system. Um, and sort of giving up encryption for millions of people because that is what you're giving up. That's whole, that is the other problem. There's no nerd hardware on this, really. Technologists have tried a lot of times and you can't do it. You can't write it in a way that only the good guys will get it. Yeah, you either have encryption or you don't, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you can't be a little bit pregnant. You can't have a little bit of encryption. That's uh, one or the other. So uh, I'm going to drill down on this, and I think you, you all know, know the answer, but it's the, the latest flavor of uh, uh, how we might, you know, have the cake and eat it too uh, with encryption is client-side scanning. So this is when uh, the message is encrypted from uh, one phone to the, the other phone, and then each phone's app will scan it after it is received or perhaps before it is sent and then scanned again on the other side. But it's end-to-end -end in between things and so you have your end-to-end -end encryption what what's the issue with that oh okay i'll do it go for it <laughs> it doesn't work um it doesn't work and it, it it's it, it ends up, actually i think client side scanning is how those two google um fathers got um, that's not exactly work but like it was the idea is that it's only on your device, but then it still gets uploaded. And it, like Apple has actually been trying to do this for a while because they're under a lot of pressure from the U.S. government, and they are trying to find some way. You know, ever since the San Bernardino situation, they are trying to find a path forward because they have a lot of people who are advocates for missing and exploited children coming to them and saying, "You need to do something, Apple. Bad guys are using your phones," and you know they don't want to be associated with that, and they're under a lot of pressure, right? So to sidestep this kind of regulation that we're talking about, they're trying to come up with a way to do it voluntarily that still keeps their encryption promise to their customers. And they recently, actually, I think just a few days ago, like officially just walked back from it and said, "We, you know, we're not even trying okay, anymore. This doesn't work, right?" Yeah, so they, they, they uh, I think what, what Corinne was uh, talking about is earlier, uh, Apple proposed having a thing where they would scan photos that were being uploaded into your iCloud for people's photo storage, uh, and then only, you know, report those ones that, that had a hit, uh, and many people uh, you know, the, saw that as uh, a, a privacy issue, and there are also a lot of problems with the scanning software itself. People, the a version of it came out in, in a beta, and people were able to find ways of having false positives and, and things like that. Um, but uh, I would also just add, add on to that one of these sort of, there's also I mean, an elevated level to a principled uh, thing is what is end to end encryption? What is the point of end to end encryption? It's so you have a secret message between two people. And so to sort of reframe it as the government has tried to do is that the only important thing is, is getting it from one phone to the other, but then you breach the secrecy as soon as it gets to either phone is, is not what end-to-end -end encryption is about. It's trying to make it so you can have a private conversation. And anything that provides less than a private conversation, no matter what, how you sort of technically describe it in a way, is not the end to end encryption because the ends are the people you're trying to get to and reframing as ends being devices in order to subvert that and achieve the same result as if you were scanning it on the wire is just semantics and it is not keeping the promise of end to end encryption. And I will also point out there are lots of reasons people want end to end encryption. I mean, this is not just, you know, I, I think the stereotype for, for quite a while in the, in the media is like, well, you only want end-to-end -end encryption if you're a drug dealer. 
Um, it, was, it sort of reminds me of that John Mulaney bit about, like, Venmo is for drug dealers. I don't know what you normal people are doing on it. Uh, but, the you know, there are lots of reasons people want end-to-end -end encryption, um, you know, other than just a sense of privacy. Um, whistleblowers use it to talk to journalists. Um, you know, I just prefer, you know, in a universe where major social media companies are data mining the hell out of everything, I would prefer to have something end-to-end -end encrypted so that I am not feeding more data to our robot overlords. Um, just, there's, you know, tons and tons and tons of reasons to want to do it, and I think we tend to get lost in this narrative of, well, the bad guys use encryption, you know, and the sort of second unspoken half of that is, so why would you want to use it? Are you a bad guy? And the answer is no, just people prefer to have private communications. Well, there's also, too, for me, there's a kind of a basic principle that I, I think it's really important that we not lose sight of. Um, and as so much as happens in the cloud, I think it's easy for us to lose sight of it. But at EFF, anyway, we've always thought it was really important that you should have control over your own device. Like, that's kind of like a basic autonomy. Like, that device is yours, whether it's your laptop or your iPad or your phone or whatever it is. If it's yours, you should have the ability to control what's in it, what's not in it, um, and how it works. And as soon as when you, you have a situation where, you know, some third party, and often maybe unbeknownst to you, is actually you know, controlling your device in one way or another, where like you just don't have a choice either way, that's very worrisome. I mean, it is a, a reason why it's worth thinking about when you use cloud type services, because what you're doing there often is now you you just uploaded your stuff to another device that you don't control. Um, but that's maybe another panel. But, but it is a point of, you know, kind of just on this most basic level, it's worrisome when we have um, governments or other third parties in a position to decide for us how our devices are going to work and what's going to be on them and what isn't. Yeah, what's the joke about the cloud is a fancy term for someone else's computer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you need an example, the end-to-end -end encryption thing, I always think about um, this came up during one of the Trump prosecutions that like the folks were using Signal to communicate, but they had iCloud backup turned on. Uh, and so it was like Rudy Giuliani, of course, and like I, some other putts who was in that that sphere um we're having these signal chat it might have been michael cohen uh and they were having these chats and they're like it's encrypted it's fine and then they whoops they had icloud backup turned on which in fact was someone else's computer so they could subpoena it and it was not the whole thing was pointless but that actually points to something else oh and then i see we have questions yeah. one of the things is that it is not like law enforcement doesn't have any tools um to get bad guys they go after bad guys all the time in all kinds of ways. And uh, bad guys expose themselves in all kinds of ways. If you look at the January 6th prosecutions, for example, uh, that's, there were things that were happening that, was encrypt that, were, that were encrypted. There was lots of other stuff that wasn't. And also they used like a lot of very traditional um, law enforcement techniques. You know, you get a witness, you get them to flip. You do all that kind of, you know, all those law enforcement techniques are still available even though people are using the internet to communicate. And I think the sort of notion that um, it's just simply impossible to go after folks um, or that law enforcement has suddenly lost all of those tools is just silly. They just want a new one. And they, so the question is, does that new tool justify the trade-off? That's what I was going to say. Legally speaking, they have the tools. They want the easy one, not just a different one. They want the easy one. Because yeah. that, that's much easier just, OK, cool, there it is. Yeah, I mean, just sort of to, to uh, I guess, yes and that. I mean, one of the issues here is somewhat of a, like a, a due process principle in the sense that uh, with a warrant, they can seize a phone and they, you know, often were able to seize the phones and keep them from locking uh, and, you know, as a practical matter. But they had to go through some process and do that. And it's easier just to have things either automatically scanned. And there's also a civil liberties difference between a government targeting someone because they have shown to a magistrate that there's probable cause that a crime has occurred and looking over all the communications automatically. Like this is a, a major distinction. A lot of what end-to-end -end encryption protects against is mass surveillance. If you are targeted, there are other ways of doing it. And these are the traditional law enforcement tools. But as, as Duane is saying, they want it to be easy to just be able to have everyone's communications and look whenever they, they would like. Uh, and that creates sort of uh, a dystopian society right, where you 
don't have these protections of the rule of law and due process and getting making sure that there's a warrant that is uh, you know approved by a judge before that privacy is pierced. Um, so if, if want to shift gears or do you have something? No, one thing I wanted yeah. to add to that, since you were talking about the, the legal process, uh, my understanding is if, if this act were to pass, basically, and companies are, are in essence required to you know, provide that information, doesn't that undermine the actual usability of the evidence because now they have inserted themselves into the judicial process? And so very perversely, in the name of protection, they've actually destroyed the evidence that they can use, at least under the Fourth Amendment as we understand it. It is, yeah, it's interesting. So the, the, uh, when companies report to NCMEC, uh, and that's a requirement that they, they report, but the, but the notion is that this is not state action because the companies are doing it and they're, they're private parties acting in it, and NCMEC is a government-affiliated but theoretically private entity, and there's a bunch of fancy dancing that uh, tries to make it so it's not state state action, so that uh, the warrant requirement doesn't doesn't apply. And yeah, potentially these bills would undermine that, and certainly a lot of defense attorneys would at least assert that. And, uh, and, they, and um, well, the 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 uh, next topic I wanted to get into is sort of well, so Earnit has been uh, introduced uh, in three of the last four years, and the last two times it failed. Um, why do they keep introducing it again, uh, and uh, or variations of it, like the Stop CSAM Act, when it when it keeps on failing? Well, I can yeah. hazard a guess. It's good fun to hate on big tech, so there's that. Um, and it's easy for people to forget that we're not when we talk about Section 230 protections, we're not just talking about Google and YouTube and X or whatever, Twitter, blah blah. Like we're there are thousands, millions, I think, of platforms, big and small, uh, that rely on 230 protections. Anybody, it, the people who send emails are relying on 230 protections. They don't know it, but in fact they are. So 230 is, is a really important protection for many, many different kinds of entities, but it's easy and, and um, makes you look good in Congress in front of a lot of your constituencies to hate on tech companies. Um, because a lot of people are mad at tech companies, and you can see why. We're in the middle of a great big tech backlash, and it well earned, I think, in many cases. But I think that's part of it, and it's also, you know, it, if you say you're, I'm doing something against big tech for children, like, that's golden. Many people will vote for it for that reason alone, which is why uh, entities like EFF and PK and all of us have to keep doing the work of explaining that's actually not what's happening here. Let us explain what's really going on here. And it takes a lot of work, and it also takes um, activating people. So we killed Earn It last time because 200,000 people um, went to act.eff.org and made noise about it. We, we have an action center to make it really easy for you to talk to your, uh, your Congress people. Um, and, you know, but we keep having to do that again, and I think they're counting on basically people just getting worn down. And, and running out of energy to, to keep doing the work. Um, that's, anyway, well, that's my well, cynical answer. Excellent transition, and I guess to my, my next question, what could people in this room do if they wanted to uh, oppose these bills? Well, so they could go to act.eff.org. That's one place I could go. Um, they could also go to EFF on the second floor, has a uh, table with all kinds of good swag and you can become a member of EFF or just contribute if you want. And either way, you know, you can um, sign up for our mailing list so you will know when we need you to act. Um, it's really the thing that has been drilled into me by my um, lobbyist friends is that um, all that, that Congress really cares about other than donations is their constituents. If they hear from their constituents in their district, um, ideally by phone, it's amazing, but sorry. Um, they respond to that, and that is how we have killed these bills over and over, is by people speaking up on behalf of other people, people who understand why encryption is important and, and sort of backing us up so they know it's not just like these radicals in San Francisco and like these crazy people, PK, um, but actually, you know, my constituencies care about this, and I will not be fooled. Yeah, definitely call. Um, this is like the pro tip as somebody who spends a lot of time on Capitol Hill. Um, 
Calling is a way, way better way to get their attention than to send an email. And I speak as a millennial who hates to talk to people on the phone. Um, you just, you get a live person, you can express it, be nice to them. They're staffers, they're making at most $30,000 a year. They're not paid enough for the kinds of phone calls they have to handle. Um, but, you know, tell them what you think about it. They will take notes. They have to report back to their boss to summarize all the calls that they've gotten. It is the quickest way to get someone's ear. And if you really want, it shouldn't be this way, but if you want to amplify that, make a small donation. That's just unfortunately, that's what they care about. They care, yes, about their constituents, but they care even more about their constituents who make a donation. So, you know, you send them 20 bucks, 40 bucks, whatever, you're on their list then your voice will be heard a little bit more. Again, it shouldn't be that way, but I didn't invent the system. All right. Well, we uh, let's maybe turn to a uh, question. I say one, one in the back. If you just come up to this uh, microphone here in the, uh, the aisle, uh, and then we'll, we'll take questions. Yeah. Come, you have to come up to the mic. Come up to the, to the mic so, uh, so the recording gets the question and everyone can hear it clearly. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to see if you could speak about potential implications that CSAM and EARNIT would have, if passed, with existing and proposed state law. Specifically, I'm ta um, uh, thinking of a uh, state law that the state of Texas uh, uh, just passed regarding the um, deputizing of non-legal, uh, non-law enforcement persons regarding uh, rounding up of migrants and uh, and especially in light of the recent news article with the Texas Tribune and Military Times that saw them uh, uh, spying on uh, a bunch of these uh, populations and migrants through their WhatsApp. And what are you thinking that the potential implications might be with CSAM and uh, Earn It if uh, that was passed and um, these laws still exist? It's bad. That's my take. That's, that's a bad juju. And as a native Texan, let me just say, I'm sorry. On, beha on behalf of my state government, I'm sorry. Not yours to apologize for, but. Uh, but, but it is actually quite important specifically because one of the things that, two, as you've heard, that 230 protects against is, in fact, um, platforms being targeted by states, right? Um, federal criminal law, okay, but not state criminal law for the most part. There's some contours around that because of FOSTA SESTA, but still, mostly that's where we are. In a world where state laws are all over the place these days, right, on a whole bunch of different things, um, it does create a situation where uh, I think you are likely to see um, state AGs in red states going after platforms associated with blue states, and you know, that, like, I expect we'll see a lot of that. Um, and um, right now, that's just not happening because there's these 230 protections, which is very frustrating for a lot of state AGs and not necessarily, you know, badly motivated ones. It's just that they sort of feel like the Internet is being used for all these purposes I think are criminal. I would like to be able to go after um, sites for doing that. So there's an example where a state AG recently in a filing, um, I think it was just last week, um, said, among other things, that abortion fund sites are involved, engaged in criminal conspiracies. And so they have every right to go after them if they want to. And, uh, you know, that is whatever it is. It is their viewpoint. Like, this is criminal activity. And as the state attorney general, it affects my constituents in my state. And I should be able to go after um, these conspirators. I don't know that that wins eventually in a court of law, right? We're not there yet. But I think it does mean that, like, it's it's not like a hypothetical politically like that does thing. that has won. I mean that's where Sesta Fosta came from. Really, yeah. it was a push by state AGs who were <clears throat> frustrated with their inability. What they saw is their inability to pursue sex traffickers because of Section 230 protections that made it difficult for them to do what they felt they had to do. Um, one of whom is currently the vice president. Uh, was was a big push behind Sesta Fosta um, during her time as California's AG. So. Okay. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry to I'm, no, I'm from New Jersey. Yeah. I am no, innocent of all things. No, 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 these haven't passed yet. That's the thing. They have not passed yet. Right? Oh. And we can stop them. We've stopped them three times. We will keep doing it. Um, uh, sorry. And a follow-up question. If you want to go and emphasize your opposition, do you find it helpful to visit in person if they still happen to have in-person office hours? Sure. 
Yeah. So actually, great, uh, great fact. Um, every every staffer in Congress that I have spoken to since the pandemic basically said, "I love Zoom. I want to do nothing but Zoom meetings from now until the heat death of the universe. Um, I hate in-person meetings over my dead body." Uh, the upshot of this is it is very easy now to talk to the staffers of your Congress critters. Um, if you call up and say, I am a constituent, I'm very concerned about this, I would like to speak, especially if you have any kind of job title with any sort of expertise on this, drop it uh, and say, I would like, who is your staffer in charge of this? I'd like to reach out to them and talk to them about how you are thinking about these things and some concerns that I have. Now, you may still just say, you may get a response of, well, I can take your concerns down and pass them along, but, uh, you know, it, it's worth a shot, um, and it means that you don't have to travel to Washington, D.C. You can do <laughs> virtual meetings. That is just common. I live in Washington, D.C., and people would rather do Zoom meetings rather than doing them in person. So it is easier than ever right now to be able to access staff and talk about these things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have any other uh, questions from the audience? Yeah, come on up. One thing I, th I think that was interesting you, you talked about is 230 covers email transitions. And encryption is really important for a lot of big companies. Why aren't they pushing back? We, like, we know Congress donations and in, in ultimately these big companies in their lobbyists, but why is there no pushback from them? Because encryption it, with corporate secrets and stuff like that is, is, I don't see that going away. I would assume a large part of it is optics. This I mean, is a thing that, I mean, so like, you know, the, the San Bernardino shooter was one of the first times this really, you know, busted into the mainstream media coverage, and it was after a mass shooting. Um, so I would assume that there's some hesitancy to wade into this for I mean, fear of looking like you're defending a bad guy. Or until they have to. Or until they wait have to. Wait until it becomes necessary, then more will. I think, um, yeah, I, I would t tend to agree. I mean, I think for, for a lot of the things where, where uh, encryption has been in danger, the, the companies have said there is great value to encryption. And it, it, it used to be that the big bugaboo that was the reason why we had to have backdoors encryption was terrorism. That was from the early 2000s. And then uh, Apple pushed back and, you know, the... Uh, in the court of public opinion, was pretty successful with it at the San Bernardino thing. That that I think that uh, the FBI and DOJ were anticipating a lot of like sort of public pressure on Apple to give in and, and, and do this, and that wasn't materializing. And there were a lot of people who were very much in support of Apple on that, uh, even though terrorism, um, and that that sort of change, and we started to see more bills designed to get around end-to-end -end encryption and do scanning of, of communications, uh, moving more towards the uh, the protecting children. And SESTA-FOSTA was an example where the big companies um, did not fight against it, or even I think Meta supported it in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may be due to the public perception and pressure that, they, that you know, it, it's... Uh, you can make complicated, nuanced arguments about how this won't actually do much to, to help the children, has all these collateral damage and such, but there is definitely a fear that anything that requires a complex explanation uh, is is harder to do, and when it involves uh, children, it, it, it does make it more more, more challenging, because like, like they all do want to protect the children, and there are other better ways of doing it, but uh, it makes it more difficult to message around this, uh, this bill and they're under a lot of heat for a wide variety of things. This is especially true given how these bills are framed, because they're talk about it in terms of, we're just gonna have a commission that's mm -hmm. gonna have best practices, you know, and there'll be a lot of different things, and there'll be different people on it, and, and we promise we won't really affect encryption. There's like language saying that, which, but it, it's, yeah. it's just tricky. Um, lawyerly sidebar on this. Um, is anybody, uh, show of hands, are any other lawyers in the room? Okay, well, we got a couple. All right, you'll appreciate this. Oh, hey, Amy. Um, what's up? Uh, so one of the fun things about this commission that Ernit creates is it is not actually an administrative agency. It is, I guess, my understanding is it produces recommendations but those recommendations just incidentally have the force of law uh, in that they can strip you of your Section 230. Uh, and it's, you know, there's some government folks, but there's also going to be companies, so we're all going to sing along. And this is a constitutional nightmare, um, largely because uh, 
it would have to be some kind of administrative. There would need to be an organ of government, and you will never get a Republican right now to agree to create a new administrative agency. And so that's sort of this too cute by half, like, oh, well, it just it's just recommendations that just incidentally have binding effect in a court of law. Um, Non-delegation doctrine. Non-delegation. Anyway, nerd out. Nerd out done. So uh, one of the things that uh, jumped out at me that you said earlier was that when they did an audit of that database, only 20% was actually uh, child abuse content. And I've worked for a company that we had a guy that was the liaison with the FBI and that uploaded content to our customers' websites would, you know, if it needed to be, we would coordinate with them and some of that content would end up in that. What was the rest of the content in the database? Are they using this to uh, target other people? What, what's that 80% if only 20% is useful? You know what, I don't, I don't know. I just walk away with the 20% in my okay. head because that was such a low percentage. It, so I'm not sure, I mean, sometimes it'll be duplicates. Sometimes it'll be, but that, but that matters because Nick Nick will say like, look, it's millions of images. And it's like, well, it's actually, a lot of those are duplicates. A lot of those are, you know, and, and it's hard to talk about without seeming like you're minimizing mm -hmm. the actual harm because like even 20%, that's a 20, that's a lot of awful, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's just that it, it's it, the real point, and, and actually, there's what Facebook also did a similar study of, of the stuff that it had uploaded to NickMick, and they were at 40% from just the content that they had that was verifiably CSAM. And of course, someone has to go and look at it, so that's a fun job. Um, but <clears throat> but the point of it is just to recognize that these databases that they have are just not infallible, and they're treated by law enforcement and in a lot of the ways that people talk about this stuff as if there's just this is just utterly infallible definitely horrible material and so the question is just how do you go after the bad guy but it isn't you know whether they're whether the the material is in fact csam it's also so, worth pointing out just really quickly that these are databases of known images which means they are fundamentally retrospective um, relying on a NCMEC database is going to catch the images that are A, exist, B, have found their way into the database, uh, and C, are, well, well, I guess step one, exist, step two, are known, and step three, have made their way into the database. Um, anything new that is not known, that has not been uploaded, that has not been hashed, by Nick Mick is going is not going to be captured. So I think we we tend to over rely on this database model. And you know, okay, this, I'm not going to come up with a perfect solution. This is a I think if there's one thing to walk away from this panel with, it's that this is a, a there are serious, extremely complex problems underlying the motivation for these bills, and these bills are coming at it in a very bad, ham-fisted kind of way. Um, having said that, again, these databases are fundamentally retrospective. They are not going to catch new things that are coming in. They are both somehow simultaneously over and under-inclusive um, of images that you want to scan for. Any, uh, <coughs> any other questions? Nice jacket. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Something that y'all have kind of alluded to, and um, is that the way that these these bills and these kind of um, added tools for law enforcement are being uh, couched is that you know it's to protect the children. We're stopping CSAM. We're stopping sex trafficking. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that that we're getting hammered on that. And like two of you have both, you know, said you know oh, and of course everybody wants to help the children. Obviously, everybody in the room knows that. And like, it's still, we're still like even doing it to ourselves that, you know, we're like feeling like we're on the unpopular wrong side and outside of legislation and outside of the courtroom, how do you think we should be framing our argument to counter this disingenuous, we're helping the children argument? Like, how do we, how do we talk about this in a way that that doesn't get us shouted down. Thanks. So one thing um, that we do 
is we talk a little bit about which children. Um, there are children, teenagers, pre-teenagers, who desperately need encrypted communications. Um, depending on where, you know, what kind of vulnerabilities or what they're experiencing in their lives, they need, those children need encryption. Um, so th <clears throat> part of it is to really just like take the, the effect on children head on and say like, you're choosing some children over other children. Um, and, it, and again, <clears throat> and also, but then also say, and there are better ways of going after CSAM material than this way. And which there are. There's a lot of things that um, that folks can do, and there's a lot of other kinds of steps that actually have nothing to do with law enforcement, that have to do with protecting children more broadly, so they don't end up abused in this way. Invest in those kinds of protections. So it's sort of like I, one of the things that we try to do is not just talk about how you're going to mess up encryption, but also talk about how you actually this is not the way to protect the children. There are better ways, there are strong ways, and like let's, we don't have to run away from that. And there are child advocacy groups who have gotten into the fight, um, <clears throat> particularly ones that are focused on um, transgender and LGBTQ teens. I mean that's a, an obvious one, but also people who work with children and work to fight child exploitation. And we'll also say, this is not the right path. This is not like, I think they would also say, you could give us more money so we could actually protect children and intervene and do all these things um, that we sh they should be able to do. But sort of looking at like, what can law enforcement do is, is really, that's just a, one piece of the puzzle and maybe not even the most effective way in. I will say I get to speak from the incredible position of privilege and a lot of axes, but one of which is I am a mother and I get to lead in my statements with as a mother, um, which does get you obnoxiously a, a lot of grace in these conversations. I am a mom of two young kids. Um, and I think there is actually, just from the purely rhetorical standpoint, you know, let's set aside, I think, because you asked mostly about framing. If we're talking on framing, let's just assume that you're not going to be able to get into these nuanced conversations about this. Um, I think there is right now we are going through, even outside of this particular issue, a sort of very broad reassessment of the relationship between parents and children and how attitudes about parenting are constantly in flux socially. Um, but I think really in the last 20 years, I'm, I, so I, I was born in 1986. My older brother was born in 1974. Okay, you, you cannot overstate how wildly different. Same mom, just our upbringing was so wildly different. You know, he grew up in the 70s, small town Massachusetts, could roam out until the streetlights came on, came home. I grew up in the 1990s in suburban New Jersey during the peak of like, people are gonna snatch your kids news coverage and I had an 8 p.m. curfew and I wasn't allowed to play Dungeons and Dragons. Like it was just same parents, wildly different. Um, the pendulum is swinging right now. And I think there is a lot more, I think it's a lot less weird now than it would have been 15 or 20 years ago for a parent to come out and say, no, I want my kids to be able to have encryption. Like my kids aren't my property. Like they should have their own autonomous lives. They need to have some privacy. They need to have some like leeway on how they move through the world, and that includes online. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't recommend having kids for the purposes of having uh, <laughs> some insulation in this debate. Um, but I do think that there's the, how we view children is like kind of shifting pretty radically, um, especially in light of, you know, A, just frankly, the just incredible amounts of attacks on queer youth in this country, um, and B, you know, I think there's a, a, a lot of um, debates around encryption have really, frankly, one of the upshots of, uh, you know, George Floyd and like the Black Lives Matter protest is I think people are revisiting the criminal justice system with a very skeptical eye. Um, and so it is easier to have these conversations about like, how much do we really want to give law enforcement these kinds of tools in how they're going to react to our communities? All right, well, we actually have come to the end of our hour here. So uh, thank you uh, to our panelists and to our audience. Audience, uh, please remember to go onto your DragonCon app and rate this panel so you can have more of this uh, kind of content in future years. Uh, and then if you're interested, uh, EFF has a speakeasy event uh, tonight at 7. 7 o'clock at Max Lagers. So come by. And come by to that or go to the table downstairs. And thank you all for being here.